take a look at um, the large topic then of buy-to-let mortgages. Now, buy-to-let mortgages are known as a specialist mortgage scheme, of course. So let's put uh, buy-to-let up, 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 up on the, the big board here for you. Buy-to-let there you go. mortgages is what we're taking a look at. Now, it's a big topic. There's a lot in the book on it. It's been enhanced over the last few years. It's a specialist mortgage. Not every broker deals with them. And when you get into them big time, you do have to understand some of the detail that goes on with uh, buy-to-let mortgages because there's a lot of detail when you open up the hood. Now, what's the point behind a buy-to-let mortgage? Well, the whole, the whole reason for a buy-to-let mortgage is that you have a property which a landlord... Yeah, let's put our landlord here for you. That's our landlord. I love the phrase landlord, don't you? It's very historical British thing, isn't it? The lord of the land. It's a bit old-fashioned, isn't it? But the person that rents the property. Now, this landlord is um, a business person, possibly, or just somebody who wants to invest some money. And they want to borrow money to buy a property to rent out. And that's pretty much where the buy-to-let mortgage comes in. Because the mortgage is granted um, not on the uh, landlord's ability to pay it, but the mortgage is granted. Let's put your mortgage up here for you. Because we're going to get quite visual later on for you. Let's put the mortgage up here for you. There's your mortgage. My typical picture of a mortgage. There you go. The mortgage is granted on the ability of the tenant. There you go. There's your tenants. Let's put them in there for you. To pay the rent to the landlord. And the whole point is that the lender looks at this money that's coming from these tenants which is obviously supported by this lovely property, and they lend the money accordingly. And that's the buy-to-let mortgage. So there's no um, you know, affordability angles or working out somebody's salary or any, any of that palaver. So it's a really good business model. And the point about buy-to-let mortgages is that the, um, the repossession rate, the arrears rate, is really low. So a lot of the specialist lenders love doing it. And of course, they, they then securitize them because they're easily to, to take on board. Institutions like buying... Uh, mortgage-backed securities based upon landlord-based properties. Um, other than that, not much going on really, but let's open up the hood and start looking at the detail. Now, the point is though that these mortgages are not regulated. They're not regulated by MCOBs and FCA and stuff like that because the, the mortgage itself is buying a property that's not been lived in by the owner of the mortgage because that makes it a residential mortgage. These are lived in by other people, therefore they're, 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 not, by, they're, they're not regulated. And there is one exception to that, known as the consumer buy-to-let. So let's squeeze that one down here for you. The consumer buy-to-let it's known as. You might have come across the phrase. But the consumer buy-to-let is where the landlord doesn't do this for a living, effectively. They're not doing it as a profession. They're doing it as a part-time thing. Um, George Osborne, which I'm later, killed off this part-time landlord with his tax changes. And the whole point was people were at dinner parties and you know, they, they had some money to invest and they talked about their property they bought because it was very tax efficient. Talk more about it later. So these part-time landlords, these people that inherit a property, for example, um, and don't really want to rent it out, but they don't want to sell it either, so they rent it. It's not their intention because they've inherited the property in the first place. These are known as consumer buy-to-lets. The landlord is effectively a consumer, a normal individual person. They didn't really want to do it, but has done it for one property, maybe, maybe one or two, but usually just one. They stumbled across it, they inherited a property, for example, and they're only renting it out until the market improves. Now, if it's de defined as a consumer buy-to-let, then it is regulated. So it comes under MCOBs, it comes under affordability, and all the normal checks are done at, like any normal mortgage. But um, if the landlord is known as a professional landlord um, or a commercial landlord, you've heard different phrases, if they're known as a professional landlord or portfolio landlord, then it is a non-regulated product. So that's the first thing to, to get comfortable with. So a business buy-to-let then, or a commercial buy-to-let, um, has has all the, 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 the factors of a buy-to-let mortgage, which, for example, would be um, interest only on the mortgage. So the mortgage itself, different colour pen for you. So the mortgage itself, here we go, would be interest only. Very few buy-to-let mortgages are ever done on a repayment basis. Um, it requires tenants, of course. 
tenants to pay the mortgage. Um, fixed typically, um, but it can be a variable rate, but typically they're fixed. Interest rates come about as well. High fees, um, I've, I've seen in some of these, you know, 2,000 pound arrangement fees plus, you know. So they are, they do come with high fees. They often pay high proc fees to the broker, which makes them quite lucrative as well. Um, but the other thing is the, the loan to value is normally less than 80%. So you're not going to get high loan to value mortgages on buy to lets because you don't. And um, the whole point is that uh, you've got this, this low loan to value, 80%, sometimes 75%. The landlord, they don't care what that person's earning, really. They don't look into that if it's a professional one. They want to make sure the landlord can look after themselves. They've got income from other sources because the, the big worry they have is the landlord decides to live in the property. And that's a no-no, of course, because the lender is using the property as security here. It's this ability of this, 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 this pad to be rented out and make a regular income. That's what they're using as security for the mortgage that they're lending. They don't want the landlord to move in. So they want the landlord to have you know, another source of income, if you like, um, some other kind of, uh, of money coming in. It could be from the rental business, of course. It could be from another job. Okay, what's the biggest thing though with, with these things is what they call the, the, the rental coverage rate ratio. So let's put that in there for you, rental coverage. That's how they do this, the rental coverage yeah, ratio. That's how they calculate how much money somebody can borrow. And the whole point about an interest coverage ratio, call it what you like, is that they will lend a certain amount of money according to how much rent is going to be paid. And they send a valuer out who values the property for rental purposes. And they might say, well, this particular property on the open market would have a monthly calendar rental of £1,000 per month. And that then allows the lender to lend the, the, uh, you know, the landlord the money they need. And they do it on a percentage basis. And you've probably heard different figures being banded around. You might, for example, have a rental coverage ratio of 125%. You might have a rental coverage ratio of 150%, depending on the system and the scheme. And we'll talk about that in a second. And of course, that one would make the landlord very happy, and that one would make the landlord unhappy. And you've got to figure that out and why, why that is. And I'm going to explain that to you now. Now, the landlord, of course, wants to borrow money to buy the house, to rent it out. And the landlord can have to put you know decent deposit down 15 20 percent or so 25 percent and the rest of it they want to borrow now they have this percentage of rental coverage ratio now i'll give you give you a metaphor for this one um in a couple of weeks time we're off up to scotland for the weekend we're, we're, we're driving up on the friday and we're going to see my, my stepdaughter who's at university there and we're going to stay in a hotel i think it's two or three nights in this hotel and the hotel is going to cost 300 pounds for three nights in in, in edinburgh so I'm, you know, I've got three hundred pounds to pay the hotel. So let's just look at that number there, because I want to give you this sort of metaphor, really. So th there's my Scotland trip there. there you go. Scotland, and uh, the hotels can cost me three hundred pounds for three nights, and, that, and that's the rent, effectively. The problem is, though, when I get to the hotel, there will be extra costs. There'll be dinner, breakfast, all those things you've got to pay. And more than likely, I'm going to have to pay about £450 for, for the cost of staying in the hotel because all the, you know, the breakfast, the dinner, the room service, all that kind of stuff. Now that £450 as a percentage of the £300 comes in, and fortuitously enough, at 150%. And that's where this rental coverage comes in because effectively the rent's £300, but I'm going to have to find £450 to cover everything. So what the lender says is, look, you know, we'll, we'll let you have the money, but um, we're only going to lend you a, a percentage of, of the rent. We're, we're going to expect you to have to fork out more you know, to cover the costs. So, so the rent, for example, um, could be, say, £600. So let's just put some numbers down here for you. So let's just say that the rent on this property is £600 per calendar month. Yeah. The lender will now lend um, money at a, at a percentage of this. So, for example, let's say that they went for 125 percent, and um, they went for 600 pound a month mortgage. 125 percent would allow, because that's the smiley face there, would allow a mortgage of 480 pounds. 
per month. Put that in there for you in red. So you do, do your calculate. The computers do this anyway. So £480 per month is interest from the mortgage. 125% of that is 600 quid, and that's how they work it. So the most mortgage that the landlord could have at 125 would be £480. And that's the monthly interest on the mortgage. That's the most they let them have. And that, of course, would give you a mortgage of, um, I don't know, two or three hundred thousand pounds interest only. Because this is interest only, of course. This is not repayment mortgage. Interest rates are very low. So that's a pretty good thing, £480. Now, as you can appreciate, of course, the landlord's making £600 a month rent and they're having to pay the mortgage of £480. But of course, the landlord's got other costs. You know, they've got to pay other, other, other costs. Buildings insurance, for example. Maintenance. There'll be periods where the tenant isn't around. I rented for two years just down the road. I moved out and the landlord didn't actually rent that property for another six months. He had six months with no rent coming in. So that's why there's, a, there's this buffer, if you like. And if he went on the 150, it changes everything. So I've done, I've done the numbers before. It brings that down to 400 pounds per month. So at 150%, the lender would only lend 400 pound a month mortgage at whatever rate, rates that gives you. So that's 150% of that gives you 600 pounds. Do you see how it works? So the higher the percentage, the less money the landlord can borrow. And that's causing problems in the marketplace because some properties are very expensive. Take, take for example, London. Okay, rent's high in London, so you might find a one-bedroom flat in Battersea, for example. You might be able to rent that out for you know, £1,500 a month because it's expensive. But to buy a one-bedroom flat in Battersea is going to cost you £400,000. So you need a big mortgage for that. The rental coverage might not allow that. But if you say went up to, um, I don't know, up, up, up to Gloucester, for example, or, or you went up north to say Burnley or Nelson, somewhere around that, you can buy a one bedroom flat for about 45, 60,000 pounds and rent it out for about 400 quid. So the numbers work further north. In London, South East, the numbers aren't working anymore. And that's caused a problem to the market. So many landlords now have this concept, or many lenders allow this concept of, of top slicing. Let's put that in. There's lots of phrases here for you. Top slicing. Now what top slicing does is it uses some of the landlord's salary to supplement the amount of mortgage they can have. And a lot of lenders are doing this now. So, so say at 150%, they might only be able to borrow £400 a month mortgage, and that might not be enough. So, so the lender says, okay, well, we'll lend you more, but we're going to take some of your salary now into account because you, you know, you're going to have to pay some money out of your own income, if you like, more than just the rents paying you. So we're going to top slice, and that's fine. And that, that's basically what they do. Um, got other things for you now. We're diving into the topic. The regulators that regulate these things, remember the regulators? If it's a consumer buy to let, then of course that's regulated by the um, FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority. We love them to bits, don't we? They regulate consumer buy to lets. You've got your MCOBs and everything. That's fine. If it's a professional mortgage, you know, professional landlord, um, a business buy to let, where it's not regulated by the FCA, that's when you get all these features, then it's the PRA who regulate that. The PRA. Now, the PRA is the, uh, the Prudential Regulation Authority that regulates the banks and the lenders as opposed to brokers and people because there's two regulators. The FCA looks after the people that did the selling, pretty much. The PRA looks after people that do the lending, pretty much. And the PRA have got a bit nervous over the last few years, because they have, and they've said, look, you know, we're a bit worried about this, this, this buy-to-let rental market. It's, about to, it's going to bubble and burst. So we're going to put some restrictions on this one. And they've done this over the last few years. Now, the first restriction they did is they, um, they increased the interest coverage ratio where they, where they could. They whacked it up to 150, 145%, um, which made it difficult then for landlords to borrow more money. So the first thing the PRA then did was to increase the um, interest coverage ratio there. And remember, the higher the percentage, the less money that the landlord could borrow, that's fine. They then brought in stress testing. Now this, of course, is based upon an, an interest rate. And uh, what they said, look, you know, we'll, you know, you can do your coverage ratio at £400 per month interest, but that's based not on the rate that you're paying, but on a stress rate of, say, 4 or 5%. Because obviously stress rates mean that um, they're testing to see if you can afford a higher interest mortgage. 
So that allowed land, uh, landlords to borrow less, you see. That was the problem with stress rate. But what, what the rule there is if it's a five-year fix, then you can use that one. If it's less than five-year fix, say a two-year fix, you have to use the stress rate to work out your monthly interest payment to work out what you can borrow. Um, which is why a lot, lot of um, specialist lenders now do five-year fixed mortgages for buy-to-let mortgages because they use the pay rate as opposed to the higher stress rate itself. Um, they bought that in, which was what, not a good thing. They also bought in the portfolio checks. Now, these are pretty horrendous things, really, for, for the lender. And what they say is that this professional landlord here, who's borrowing money to buy this property to rent it out, etc. You know, we've got all these these interest coverage ratio percentages. We've got stress testing built in as well. So you know, we're restricting what they can borrow because we don't want them to overcook it. But what we're worried about is all the other properties that this professional landlord's got. So we want everything tested against the interest coverage ratio. So the whole package of properties the landlord's got are used to work out um, you know, maximum loan to value 80% and stress tested as well. So if the landlord's got, say, 10 properties they're renting, they've got to bring all the 10 properties on the desk. You know, what's the value of the property, rental value? What's the current rent you're getting? Does that, does that exceed 80% loan to value? And what's the interest coverage ratio on that, the rental coverage ratio on that? Is it within parameters? So not only are they testing for this mortgage, they're testing for the whole portfolio that's known as portfolio underwriting. It's a nightmare. As far as lenders are concerned, you know, they have to have people now taking out all the information. Brokers have to get spreadsheets together and all sorts of things to work out. Um, it's, it's often why a lot of these, these large landlords now are going, on, going to one lender to, to make things a whole lot easier for them as well. OK, so that's the regulation. Let's take a look at some underwriting and then tax on these things. Now, the lender, of course, that's lending the mortgage money on this one, they are very concerned, as I mentioned to you before, about the property. They don't really care about the landlord's ability to pay. It's the rent that's produced by the property that they really care about. So they send out the valuer. The valuer, she goes out there and she values the property, not for market value, but for the rent that it will bring in. They also want to make sure it's readily rentable. So is it in a good location for example is it in good condition is it easily rented they're going to look at that as well um, they also look at resaleability of course because lenders will need to repossess if the landlord doesn't make payments it does happen so they look at resaleability as well and uh, it's the same kind of underwriting as they would do for any other kind of property really um, there's a lot more lee leeway on things like flats above shops for example because in towns, flats above shops are often rented, aren't they? People like to have short-term rental. It's near a tube station, for example. So that's quite a common one as well. And don't forget, the, the lender's going to securitise this. Very few lenders will sit on these mortgages forever. They'll securitise them onto the open market because there's a big marketplace for these. So they want to make sure that all the paperwork's done correctly, the property, it, you know, land registry is clean and tidy, because it's the property that makes the difference. It's that that they use. That's their only security now. They don't have a landlord to fall back on. Obviously, it's the tenants making payments that you know, allows the income from the property to come through. So, so that's the underwriting, pretty much, really. So what's happened then with the changes and taxation? Let's talk about these now for you. Um, a couple of years back, George Osborne, 2015 it was, I think it was, he uh, sat down and was getting really upset about the fact that a lot of first-time buyers were losing out to landlords buying all the flats and small houses that came on the market. So a one-bedroom starter home would come on the market, for example, and everybody would go and view it. And all these lovely first-time buyers would go along and have a look. Oh, yes, this is our dream house, darling. We must buy this. But meanwhile, the, the, the nasty landlord sneaks in and buys the house from underneath this young, lovely young couple. And George Osborne thought that was wrong. So he decided to change the tax benefits of a buy-to-let mortgage or a landlord borrowing money. And in a sense, what he's done is he's reduced the tax benefits. And what they are now, and I'll put these over here for you, the tax benefits of these ones for you. So I'm going to squeeze this in over here. We're running out of room here, aren't we? Let's squeeze this around here on my board for you. Now, first of all, from from end of this tax year onwards, you, you, you get um, tax relief, but only at the basic rate of tax. Basic rate only. So what we're looking at here is the money that the landlord makes from the rent 
he or she has to pay income tax on that because it's an income, isn't it? You've got to pay income on that or tax on that. But you can reduce the tax charge by basic rate tax relief on the mortgage interest. And that was the big change. You used to be able to get higher rate tax relief on the mortgage interest. In other words, the, uh, the £600 rent you're getting coming in is great, um, but you've got to pay a mortgage, say, for example, of £400 on that. So what he would do is he would give you tax relief on that. So that mortgage interest you could literally reduce from the rent and then pay hardly any tax. So it's a really lucrative way of operating. But George changed that and, and made this only basic rate tax relief only on your mortgage interest. And that'll probably go in the next few years. Um, so that was the big change that he brought in from April 2020 onwards, basic rate only tax relief. And that's made it more difficult now for landlords to start making profit because they're having to pay a bigger tax bill now to Her Majesty's uh, customs and revenue, which is bad news. What other tax comes into buy to lets? Well, other costs that you can take off. You can take off um, costs of maintaining the property. You can take off agents' fees, furnishings, possibly, although not the white goods themselves, lease charges. So, out of this um, £600 a month rent you're pulling in, you might have to pay the, the, the agent £50 a month in agency fees. That's perfectly acceptable. Uh, you might have a, a lease charge of £10. So you can see then that the amount of money you can reduce from the rent to, to avoid paying income tax is quite quite reasonable. The basic rate relief did, uh, did hamper that quite considerably. A um, couple of tax situations for landlords. You can have to pay capital gains tax and they have to pay extra. It's plus 8% on the capital gains tax charge. Normally CGT is 10 or 18%. If you're a higher rate taxpayer, it's 18%. So they, add, they, add, they add another 8% um, on that, isn't it? Um, which, you know, it's just the way it works, isn't it? So, so you have to think about that as well. Um, it's 18% and 28% in total. For, for capital gains tax. Stamp duty land tax, you've got to pay your extra, of course, because you're, you're borrowing a, or you're buying a second property. So there's an extra 3% to pay and you've got to pay the capital gains tax within 30 days. So there's this pretty heavy taxation going on here as well, which is why many landlords now have decided to change things. And it's the last point I want to make for you. Pretty, pretty, pretty hefty video this one for you, isn't it? But there's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, these personal landlords buying these properties to rent out are being slammed for tax now. They've got costs they can take off. There's only basic rate relief available now. And there's capital gains tax to pay when they eventually sell the property. So it's becoming less and less viable to buy it in your own name. So many of them now are starting up what they call an SPV. Now an SPV is a limited company. We know about limited companies. SPV stands for Special Purpose Vehicle. And what they do is they set up an SPV and it's the SPV that buys the property. So that the, the landlord is the director of the SPV and the shareholder of the SPV and they buy the property through a limited company. And that's a pretty cool thing to do. And if you did that, there's many, many more tax advantages. So for example, if you now own the property in, a, in the company's name, the company then pays tax. The company will pay corporation tax on profits. And if the money is taken out of the business and given to the landlord, the landlord has to pay income tax on salary, dividends, uh, or, or dividend tax on, on dividends as well. So, you know, the tax regime is a lot better. There's none of this tax relief at basic rate because the, the entire mortgage payment is used to offset the corporation tax that the SPV take, makes. So it's much more tax beneficial to buy that property in a limited company, because um, it is. And, and that's why many landlords are now doing that. There's no capital gains tax to pay, for example, because any gains in selling properties um, come through on corporation tax, because you know, it's all profits, isn't it? So it's much more tax advantageous to do so. There's many more expenses you can take off as well. The costs of all goods you can take off of the profits, because it's a business now. So you've got your rent coming in, but you've also got quite a lot of costs involved in running the business and the income less costs you pay against profit. So a lot, a lot of doing that. The disadvantages, of course, is that um, a limited company now costs money to run. You've got to have an accountant. You've got to pay 
uh, accountancy fees, you've got to do corporation tax returns, um, companies' house returns as well. So there's a lot more counting going on as well. Um, the directors often have to give personal guarantees to any mortgages because that's the way that banks roll, isn't it? That's what they like to do. Um, so it's a bit more expensive to run now, a bit more complicated. And, and it's difficult to transfer a property into an SPV that the landlord already owns. So this landlord, for example, owns this property in their own name. If they want to put this property into the SPV, the SPV has got to buy it from the landlord. So there's capital gains tax charge potentially as well, and possibly stamp duty as well. You can't just shove it from a personal ownership into a limited company. So it's a little more complicated there as well. But, but many are doing it now. And once you've got a limited company SPV set up, you can buy more and more properties. And it becomes a limited company that's rental. So it makes sense if, if that's your main business model. A lot of lenders are quite happy now to lend on SPVs. Not all of them, uh, but many will do. Um, you know, you've got your Precise, Foundation. They all, they all look at um, SPV-based mortgages. It's a quite, quite commonplace. It's not a difficult thing to do. Great to securitise as well because it's it's solid. You know, if, if you're borrowing money and buying for an SPV, you're doing this in the long term, aren't you? It's not like a sort of one or two year thing. This is a long term product that you're looking to, to benefit from. So that's your buy to let mortgage. With a hell of a lot going on there. You're going to get a lot of questions in the exam on this. But bear in mind, of course, this is, is CMAP two. There's a lot more going on other than just buy to let mortgages. Um, your, your rental cap coverage ratios always come in into questions as well. The regulatory stuff always comes in as well. The FCA, consumer buy to let versus professional landlord, that, that's a question that comes in quite a bit as well. Um, the tax reliefs, not so much. CGT, of course, plus 8% for, for this, this kind of arrangement, really. Um, your SPVs, rarely would that come in as a question. You're edging it into RO7 land, which is the advanced mortgage paper really here. And I've pretty much covered everything from there for you, just to give you a good, a good feeling. And um, we've, we've overrun by a few minutes, but hey, does it really matter? I hope that's all been interesting and useful for you.